What is up, Watch Fam? Happy Monday, and welcome to this week's episode of Rant TNH. I am Christian from Theo and Harris, and today we're going to be jumping into the technicalities behind the Rolex Sky Dweller. Let's do it. All right, first, a quick wristwatch check. I am wearing a Rolex Submariner in 18 karat yellow gold. It is a reference 1680 with a beautiful matte black uh, nipple dial. I've paired it here with a Jean Rousseau Type 1 strap. I think it looks absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we recorded an awesome uh, kind of love letter to the uh, ridiculousness that is this particular model uh, last week. We released it last Thursday. We've put the link in the description below and I highly recommend you guys go on and check that video out after this. There's a lot to love and kind of hate about this watch, uh, but I'll let you decide what uh, what side of the field you fall on. Now, what is new at TNH? Uh, Logan, our resident watch geeky writer, uh, just published a really cool article uh, about, well, exploring aspects and variables that tie into ultimately residual value uh, in the wristwatch market, both new and vintage. Uh, it was a very interesting article. Uh, it was under the series Watch 101. It was just published and the link is also in our description. So if you wanna know, uh, kind of how to almost reverse engineer good residual value uh, or, or navigate the watch slopes a little bit more cost effectively, I definitely recommend you give Logan's article a read. Now, the Sky Dweller, shall we? The one Rolex everyone pretends to understand. It was introduced back in 2012. Can you believe that? I was in high school in 2000. I, I think I had a Coney shirt in 2012. Jeez, um, it seems like a new watch, but it kind of is not. Uh, initially, when the watch was released, uh, it was it was released solely in precious metals, uh, white gold, rose gold, ever rose gold, uh, and yellow gold. And it was only the second watch in the Rolex catalog, uh, the other being the day date, to, uh, to be featured solely in precious metals. So it, it had a very, very interesting, uh, super luxurious, untouchable kind of market presence. Then in 2017, uh, the watch was re-released with some you know, updates to the dial, but, but the major update was the new offering uh, of case material. Now in steel, two-tone, and rollisore. What is Rolosaur? Okay, pleading ignorance on this one, I will appeal uh, to the authority Rolex themselves to clear up the air. So this is their description of what Rolosaur is. Gold is coveted for its luster and nobility. Steel reinforces strength and reliability. Together, they harmoniously combine the best of their properties, a true Rolex signature. The Rolosaur has featured on Rolex models since the early 1930s and was trademarked as a name in 1933. It is one of the prominent pillars of the Oyster Collection. What? What does that mean? That was, that was very, that was like how teenagers describe themselves. <laughs> Why, why, why are you guys beating around the bush with everything? You're Rolex. I think you should... What is that even... I just... I, maybe I expect that from a start, like from a, from a Kickstarter, kind of like, you know, uh, I don't know, any one of those, you know, micro brands out there that describes themselves in these like super dramatic and vague terms, you know, changing the way watches are sold by cutting out middlemen and going straight to cons... You know what I mean? So is it a mixture of metals? That wouldn't make any sense. I feel like it's just too tone and yeah no it's two tone it's just, it's just a douchey swiss wealthy way to say two tone maybe two tone has too much baggage maybe maybe a market research company said listen uh patrick bateman really screwed up your whole two tone thing so uh rename it after yourself okay so bottom line the sky dweller is no longer exclusively precious now it's offered in steel combinations with both white and yellow gold but more than that you know what is the sky dweller you know beyond a i guess you know two-tone uh, 42 millimeter oyster case uh, actually it's very interesting so let's get into it. It's a dual time zone and an annual calendar, which makes it currently Rolex's most complicated watch, which is kind of funny because Rolex has a, a deep history, right, of producing complications, like the famous Patalone, a triple calendar moon phase. But since that bygone era, uh, Rolex has definitely <clears throat> erred on the side of, uh, of, of lacking complication, uh, time, date, and occasionally a day. 
So it brings us to the question, what is an annual calendar? It's a date complication that like knows the month. So in turn, it knows if the month is made of 30 or 31 days but it does not know to jump to March 1st on February 28th or 29th, which a perpetual calendar like Paddock's 3940 does. So once every year, your annual calendar will burden you with having to reset the date manually, which is all very mechanically interesting. But communication of the date is not the only job of an annual calendar. The month also goes along with it, usually in a subdial. but Rolex has kind of reimagined how to communicate the month here. Uh, you can see the month indication behind all of the hour markers. There are these little slots that are either white or red when it's that particular month. So for example, in January, the red slot would be a above the one, in February above the two, uh, and in July, the seven. <laughs> And for the simultaneous dual time, uh, it's a little bit more obvious. Your two main hands are set on your home time and the disc in the dial is set for your travel time. But the big million dollar question is this, how does one crown control all of these different functions? And that's actually where this watch becomes very interesting. You actually rotate the bezel because it has three separate settings, which gives the crown its direction. So after setting the bezel, the crown will know if you're trying to address the date, local time, or reference time, which is pretty, pretty, pretty cool Rolex. The Sky Dweller ranges in price from $14,400 for its steel Rolexor model all the way up to nearly $50,000 for its all gold with bracelet model. So really looking at the market, particularly for the entry level Rolosaur models, the Sky Dweller is a complicated and arguably more valuable competitor in that $13,000 to $20,000 range, which is a range that Rolex has kind of been weak in in the past. So looking at the market, particularly at that entry level price point, the Sky Dweller is a complicated and arguably more interesting and valuable offering between thirteen dollars and $20,000, which historically is a range that Rolex has been quite weak in. Is the watch for me? No. I really like it conceptually and in its execution, but for my wrist, it's just too big. But I do know plenty of people that can't wait to get this bad boy on theirs. So that's it. If you like this video, subscribe for more like it, and I will see you all tomorrow for all the new additions hitting the watch shop at theoandharris.com.